Essentially, what we're going to talk about today is how to protect cross-site scripting uh, against a cross-site scripting attacks at scale. Uh, at this point in everyone's application security journey, you, you're probably fully aware of cross-site scripting and fully aware of, uh, of all the protection mechanisms uh, that it has. Uh, I think I found the first cross-site scripting attack back in the late 90s. Uh, so you don't need to come to this webinar to understand what it is or how to protect against it, but it's still an issue for large and small enterprises. It's still being tested for by pen testers, and there's a lot of solutions out there, um, and we're going to talk about a few of them and how to, how to incorporate that and implement that at scale and how to check for that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, a brief history. Now, when uh, cross-site scripting was uh, getting popular, um, the biggest defense that I used to hear uh, when I used to work for this company called At Stake was input validation. So limit the characters in input fields uh, so attackers can't insert essentially JavaScript into something that is a last name field. Um, input validation is a natural first effort, uh, but essentially it didn't work very well. There was uh, plenty of ways to bypass it. Uh, if you're interested, just Google, uh, you know, bypassing input validation, and you'll see hundreds of checks um, or hundreds of results on Google. But essentially, input validation did not work very well. So the industry moved into output encoding. Output encoding mostly worked. Uh, there are edge cases where it does not work, but output encoding is a great framework. But the problem is, is that the edge cases are still very effective, and unfortunately with cross-site scripting, the edge case still matter. It only takes one or two, um, if not just one cross-site scripting attack to perform an exploit, while you could have hundreds of thousands of input fields, but it's the one that uh, where output encoding did not work is the one that gets you in trouble. And then I think the industry moved on to frameworks. So when you use a certain frameworks, a development framework, they can embedded with cross-site scripting protection, this also mostly worked. Um, so the second and third item, I would say, were fairly successful, even though it does not universally protecting against cross-site scripting across the board. And of course, attackers, pen testers, hackers, they always work. Like when your objective is to find one flaw out of 10,000, 1,000, or 100,000 use cases, uh, it's pretty darn easy to do that because it's very hard to secure 100,000 input fields across 1,000 apps uh, versus securing those. So attackers will always find cross-site scripting issues in your app. Um, it's just the way security is. And so while input validation didn't work, uh, output encoding frameworks mostly work, attackers will always find that edge case. So we come from the assumption with, uh, with 20 years of experience, as Richard mentioned in the beginning, that you will not be protect against every cross-site scripting attack. Just realize that, accept it. So in that being case, what will happen to your application when a cross-site scripting attack is identified? That's what we want to plan for. The same concept is used in many parts of security. In fact, if you're using an endpoint defense system on your laptop, a lot of CSOs do this. They assume when the laptop is compromised, what can happen to the network and the corporate data after one laptop is compromised? That's a most realistic view to take rather than um, uh, assuming no one's going to click on phishing emails. No one's going to click on uh, or download malware. Like people are going to behave the way they should. That's too optim uh, optimistic. Uh, being realistic is that, hey, when a phisher is successful to a finance person, how can we limit the attack to just only their laptop and not the rest of the network? So same thing goes here. When a cross-site scripting attack is identified on your web application, how can you prevent it from being exploited? And that's really the conversation we want to have today is assuming cross-site scripting attack is possible, how can we prevent it from being exploited? So two uh, quick options. Again, these are well-known to the industry. So we're going to talk about these briefly um, and then talk about how to check for these at scale using uh, one of Data Theorem's features. So I'm going to switch to my coworker, BJ, who has a lot of experience on uh, application security. 
Um, and uh, BJ, I'll let you talk about not only the HTTP only flag, uh, but also CSP. But why don't we start with HTTP, what it does, uh, what it's trying to do to prevent um, cross site scripting exploits, and how to implement it. Yeah, thanks, Himachu. Uh, so, uh, both of these mitigations are, again, as like Himachu said, largely about um, damage control about or about like preventing an attacker from taking advantage of a cross site scripting vulnerability. Um, this first one, H the HTTP only flag, uh, is a flag that can be set on cookies, but when like whenever the application server sets a cookie for the user. Um, what it it is confusingly named, but like what it's really about is about limiting uh, what JavaScript can do with this cookie. Uh, under normal circumstances, JavaScript code is able to read the contents of any cookie that's applicable to the current web page. Um, where at, but what the HTTP only flag does is allows like a server to create a cookie that JavaScript code is unable to read directly. Um, while it, whereas the name HTTP only me is intended to mean that like when the browser interacts with the server, it can still send the cookie like as an ambient credential to the website. So the HTTP only is um, often uh, is an often a useful tool for when you have a session cookie on a website that you do not want to allow an attacker to exfiltrate um, off to their own servers so that they can then continue to have continuing access as the user they've exploited their cross-site scripting attack against. Um, when the attacker's code is unable to read the value of a cookie set with HTTP only, um, they, they just, you know, they, they can't pull it off and you continue to use it for continuing access. Um, this is often a problem, like if a website had a lot, like has sessions that can last for like, say, days or weeks, or if the session continues to stay valid as long as someone continues to use that session. And so this is really, you know, limiting the, the kinds of exploitation an attacker can do um, to just only being able to do things within the browser itself. And, you know, as like as the only things that the application can normally do. Um, as the user that you know has been exploited against. Um, that said, some newer applications um, required the use need like the, the application's normal application code needs to be able to access the cookies value. And so in those cases, like this mitigation may not, you know, always be an easy, you know, a, a, a easy solution. But when it is an easy solution, it's a really effective way of limiting what an attacker can do, at least with the session the session information itself. The other um, mitigation that the theorem uh, strongly recommends is the content security policy header, um, which is usually shortened to CSP. Um, the CSP header was originally created to essentially as a way of mitigating cross-site scripting, uh, cross-site scripting exploitation. Like it does not necessarily prevent um, the vulnerability itself from existing, but what it can do is set a high level policy for your web pages and websites that limit what resources can be loaded by a web page. Um, in other words, like what remote servers can a web page interact with, but also it can limit how and where like JavaScript code can be loaded onto the web page. Uh, so a common approach for cross-site scripting attacks is to find you know, an input where you can inject a script tag or an attribute that causes JavaScript to run you know, into the HTML of a web page. Uh, what content security policy can do for preventing like the cross-site scripting attack directly is it can set a policy for script tags that says you're not allowed to have any inline scripts on your page, or you can outright ban uh, eval statements, for example. And so you know, these can like completely prevent like while arbitrary uh, attack or input might be able to show up on a web page, which would normally cause cross-site scripting, the CSP header can like come outright prevent it from happening. Um, if you have a sufficiently strict policy. Additionally, the CSP header can uh, uh, specify other additional policy about other kinds of resources that web pages load. For example, it can limit, you know, where, what, what websites can this page load images from, uh, what websites can JavaScript be loaded from normally, uh, when can, like, the current page be loaded in an iframe, et cetera. However, uh, the ability to limit what where resources can be loaded from 
can limit an attacker's ability. So let's say even let's say you had to allow certain kinds of dangerous JavaScript on your website because it's going to take a really long time to move off of it, or you know you use one of the more uh, sophisticated techniques that CSP provides, um, but there's a mistake in it in how it's implemented in the application. Um, the CSP header can limit the amount of damage an attacker can do still by limiting you know, the remote servers that the attacker's code can interact with. So for example, if you can only load images from your CDN, then the attacker can't try to pretend to load um, content from their own you know, attacker domain that would 404, but the browser would still attempt to do in order to say, at request, you know, request a file name that contains some sensitive piece of information that the attacker is trying to steal. So again, this sort of prevents a lot of the, uh, you know, post exploitation uh, things that an attacker would try to do, as well as limiting the ability to actually run the exploit itself. Uh, CSP policy header also uh, can contain uh, like reporting mechanisms, which are primarily useful for uh, testing and validating that your website um, has the CSP header implemented properly. Um, but in practice, you know, the reporting can often contain a lot of noise. Uh, for example, due to browser extensions that uh, inject their own content into web pages that are then being blocked by the CSP header. Um, also, like different browsers sometimes implement slightly different, have slightly different implementations, which can trigger warnings in various circumstances. But it's still a useful, you know, the reporting is a useful tool for uh, tracking whether your application is, you know, conforming to the to this policy that you can set across your websites. Um, all that said, you know, CSP, the CSP sounds like it's sort of like a really effective, powerful tool, but one of the, it for larger organizations, it can be difficult to roll out um, because, you know, a large application might access a lot of third party resources or might be made up of a large number of smaller applications that have different requirements. And so, you know, it, it can take a long time to effectively or consistently apply a content security policy header across, you know, an entire suite of applications or a large application. But again, it's like this almost, if it is like one of the most powerful tools available for limiting the amount of damage that a cross-site scripting attack can do. And that's one of the questions I was gonna actually ask you to define is, when um, would you see the need of using CSP versus HTTP only? And it sounds like when um, the, maybe the environment is so large, CSP is uh, much tougher to handle. So as a quick fix, it's HTTP only. But when you have a thorough AppSec program where you can kind of spend time on CSP, it's, it sounds way more exhaustive in terms of protection versus HTTP only, would that be correct? That's correct, because like CSP can limit like HTTP only only prevents the attacker from exfiltrating like the session your the user's session or and other information in the cookies. Um, so the attacker is still able to do some form of exploitation within the you know the victim's browser itself, uh, but you know again it, it limits the amount of damage that can be done. And so I would suggest that HTTP only gets used. Um, you know, when you have cookies that your application does not need to directly access, but needs to be sent to the server as part of like how the application works, um, then it's, you know, it's an effect, it's a useful tool, an opportunistic mechanism to enable to protect the values in those cookies. Um, and especially if like your, if your application uses cookies for propagate, sending the session to the server, whenever like, like a traditional application does, then it becomes a really important tool for limiting um, an attacker's ability to gain persistence uh, over the victim sessions, whereas a like, content security policy is a much, um, much more exhaustive can be a much more exhaustive approach to limiting what an attacker can do, and like it's something where even if initially you roll out like a, a what's called the content security policy read read only or report sorry report only uh, version of the header. Which is just a you know useful tool for just tracking is my app or, you know am I close to being able to enable enforcement for the CSP header? Um, but even like a fairly permissive CSP header can still limit like the number of things that an attacker can do, um, provided that you know the organization is going through the process of designing or re you know rearchitecting how their their front you know their client side code is written in order to work with the CSP header. 
That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and so one further question I have for you, BJ, before we provide a demo of how our product, whether it's CSP or HTTP only, can essentially test this and analyze this at scale. But when you talk about cross-site scripting protection, um, let me, before we do our demo on our product, let me actually do an anti-demo and, uh, and ask you, like, obviously Raspi um, is out there as a technology to prevent against cross-site scripting attacks. In your opinion, um, would you focus on Raspi, which requires an agent on your application server, CSP or HTTP only? Like, would you do all three? Or are there different use cases? You already described it with HTTP only and CSP, but when would Raspi be a better solution um, to, uh, across the board? Um, I'm assuming it's more intensive in terms of setup, uh, but does it offer any more protection than CSP possibly would? Um, in terms of like absolute effectiveness, I mean, RASP, RASP approaches generally, you know, focus on input validation or trying to detect um, when the input looks like an attack. And so, you know, like ideal if, you know, if I had the resources and budget as a, you know, as someone running a security program, I think that both like CSP, uh, you know, I think all three would be absolutely something to, you know, focus on. However, in terms of, and However, like also like it will say I, I'm a, I'm fairly resource constrained and I'm on a very large organization, then I would probably want to focus, you know, you know, building out a RAS solution, you know, probably makes a lot of sense, but that's a very long, you know, it's a, that's a long relationship with your RAS vendor and it's a long, uh, you know, it's just, it, that's a long process to reach a point where it's something that can be rolled out across your entire infrastructure for your application um, and, you know, including testing and so forth. Um, I think context security policy is a little, you know, it's less invasive, but it can also break an application if it's not rolled out carefully, you know, or if um, development teams are unwilling to make any modifications to try to use CSP, uh, you know, versus a RASP solution. You know, so like, I think it's, you know, it's very much something that like, I think it matters very much on like the culture of the organization, the size of the organization and like the kinds of resources available or the, you know, enthusiasm for, you know, trying to implement a, you know, mitigation. Yeah, yeah, um, totally agree. And that's why I kind of want to emphasize is that there are solutions out there. Raspi is a big, uh, big technology out in the AppSec space, but obviously there's a cost with that. There's an implementation um, hurdle that has to go through that every environment has to go through. And logistically, it, it is taking uh, a big chunk out of your AppSec uh, time and resources. Uh, versus what we're saying is there's an alternative, whether it's something as simple as HTTP only or CSP, those are free, quote unquote, free of charge. You can use them. Obviously, a program does their own CSP. But what the cool thing is, is once you have them in place, um, there's ways to essentially implement them and maintain them um, with, uh, with our product or just other free resources out there. 